I want to say how thankful I am to God for this day, for this time we have, that we might gather together, we might uh, worship in spirit and in truth. I said a moment ago about uh, been here in the past, and I have, and it's uh, certainly been good uh, to be back uh, here once more. Uh, the closer I got, of course, I just drove across Ohio through here and come through, but the closer I got, it's like, yeah, I remember this, I remember these things, I just drew, just drove right off to Bud and Linda's house. I didn't need my phone or nothing. Didn't need. I knew exactly where I was going, and uh, even though I got there a little late, but it's just been a, a good evening and and a good morning, and and so thankful to God again for this that we have this opportunity to worship and to be together. Not only today, the Lord willing, throughout the rest of this week. Um, just a little bit before I start, um, I've. I've been married now for uh, close to 30 years, I guess, and uh, I've got two boys, and one's married, and one uh, plans to be married here in a few months, Lord willing, and uh, they both have uh, jobs, and they're both doing their own own thing these days, and so it's just uh, me and my wife, and that's okay, and uh, so... I tell people, I said, anyone wants to come over, I've got two rooms, no waiting. And uh, so you're, you're welcome anytime. And, uh, but uh, I've been there at Caneyville for, well, well, that's what we were talking about uh, last night. Last time I was here, I had moved to Caneyville and was closing on a house while I was here. And we closed on the house and what have you. And then, so we've been in that house for at least 10 years. So that's about how long it's been. And uh, this congregation has always had a special place in my heart. And I just appreciate you. And I'm glad to be here. And I'm thankful that we have this opportunity. One more thing, and that's this. Um, I know I'm with the marshals this week. But just understand, if, there's some, if you have a question on what I say, or you want to study about something during the day or whatever, just know that you can get a hold of me. I'll give you my phone number, or, or they've got my phone number or whatever, and we'll make that happen. If there's somebody we need to go see, or somebody we need to visit, or more than one, or somebody needs to encourage, or uh, you know, somebody just in the hospital or whatever, something we need to do, please don't hesitate to, to say something, and I'll go with you. I'm glad to do it. You've got me here for the week, and my intention is tried to help spread the gospel and tried to help encourage, encourage the brethren here. And so you've got me for the week, so you need to milk me for all I'm worth uh, while I'm here. So uh, I'm, I'm not here on vacation. I'm here to do the Lord's work. So if I can help and do something, please don't hesitate. I told you this morning we're talking about all this week things relative to the life of Christ and just little scenes, little snippets that go through from the time of Christ's birth. We talked about Mary this morning and actually went from Mary all the way to the cross and, and beyond, didn't we? And so just, just scenes that are going on here uh, throughout the life of Christ. And what I want us to talk about this morning is kind of an overview really of who Christ is. And what I'm titling this sermon, if you want to take notes, what I'm titling this sermon is this, When Isaiah Saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we just read from Isaiah chapter 6. I want you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 6 with me. And there I want you to look and see what was going on at that, at that time. The Bible in Isaiah chapter 6, actually six chapters into the book, is when we're told about when Isaiah was chosen so as to be God's prophet. And that's what's happening right here. In the year that King Uzziah had died, he said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. The train of, of the, and his train, he said, filled the temple. And he describes here in all majestic glory this very scene, this very image that he has seen here. And he talks about the seraphims that gathered around and how seraphims, they had six wings in total, but with two wings they covered their face. With two wings they covered their feet. To cover your face and to cover your feet those were, uh, that's, a, that's a symbol or that's an expression that we're not worthy. We're unworthy to be in your presence, God. We cover our face. We cover our feet. 
With two wings they flew around, saying, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. And round and around and around the, uh, there they went, around the throne, with no rest day or night. And the whole place was filled with smoke, and that's when Isaiah sees himself and says, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And the angel comes and, 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 and takes a, a coal from off the altar and touches his mouth and tells him how he's purified now. And that, again, your sin is purged. I'm in verse number 7. And then he hears these words and he says, Who shall go before us? Verse 8. And he said, Here am I, send me. That's a song in our songbooks, or used to be. Here am I, send me. That's based on this right here. Here am I, send me. Go to tell this people to hear but understand not and see but perceive not. Make the heart of this people find, make the ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and are converted and should be healed in verse number 10. And then he says, Lord, how long? He said, till the cities be wasted and without inhabitant and the houses without a man and the, and the land be utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away. He said, and there shall be a great forsaken in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth. And it shall return and shall be eaten. As a, as a, he says, <clears throat> pardon me. As the teal tree and as the oak whose substance is in them, he says, when they cast their leaves to the holy seed, he says, and to the substance thereof. And so that ends that chapter. You say, well, that's very interesting, and there's a lot of, lot of visions going on here, a lot of, lot of symbolic language happening and, and this kind of thing. What I find interesting, you say, why did you name this sermon, though, when, the Lord's, when Isaiah saw the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you why when you look over in John chapter 12 with me. John chapter 12 is an interesting chapter. You look here in John chapter 12, Jesus is entering Jerusalem now for the last time. It was at this time certain Greeks and various ones asked Philip, we would see Jesus. We want to see him. We want to hear him. We want to talk to him. And that's whenever Jesus would tell them as you, as you continue to read. Obviously, we're not going to read uh, all, um, all 50 verses, but if you look here in John chapter 12 and you get down about verse 20 and 21, he says, there were certain Greeks, he says, and they came looking for him. We would see Jesus. Just what we're talking about. Then verse 32 and 33, he says, If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And this he did signifying what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus told him exactly how I'm going to die. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And he was lifted up, lifted up on the cross and draw all men to him. Then as you continue to read here, John himself will quote from Isaiah he says that Jesus did all of these things. I mean, verse number 38, that the, that the saying he said of, of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which said, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. That's Isaiah 59. And he said these things happened in John 12 that Isaiah 59 might be fulfilled. And it was. And then as you continue to read, he says not only this, but Isaiah again, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor hear through or understand and be converted and I should heal them. Does that sound familiar to anyone? That's just what we read in Isaiah 6. He said the things Jesus is doing uh, is in direct line with Isaiah 6, fulfilling Isaiah 6 statements. These things, saith he, I'm in verse number 41. These things said Isaiah when, <coughs> when he saw his glory and spake of him. This he said, when Isaiah saw his glory, his whose? Folks, he's talking about Jesus right here. He's talking about Jesus' glory. Mr. Linsky says, Isaiah beheld before the incarnation, John after. Isaiah beheld the heavenly vision, John beheld it in words and deeds, in the person and character of the God-man on earth. And so here's Isaiah, and what Isaiah sees in Isaiah 6 is the pre-incarnate Christ. He is seeing Jesus Christ. He has seen him in his glory. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And the reason why is because that, 
Same one of Isaiah 6 is the same one in John chapter 12, walking the earth. The same one from Isaiah 6 that we're impressed with, and I'm going to talk about, about this in some detail, is the very one that these people now can see, hear, talk to, look at, watch him, follow him, and all. Nothing about his character has changed. All that's happened, he's gone from heaven and come to the earth, but nothing about his character has changed. He's still the same one. He's still the same being or same person. What did Isaiah see when he saw Jesus Christ, number one? What he saw was he saw one who was not like a man. Isaiah 6 and verse 1 says, I saw the Lord, Jesus, or I saw the Lord high lifted up. The Lord, the word Lord there is the word which means sovereign or king, controller. He said that's who he saw. I saw the king. I saw the one who controls. I saw the one who rules. And surely he rules over everything. You turn your Bibles to Matthew 28 and verse 18. What does Jesus say? Jesus himself would say, all power, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now you think about that, folks. Jesus said, I have all the authority in heaven and earth. If he has all the authority in heaven and he has all the authority on the earth, how much does that leave for you? Think about that. How much does that leave for me? How much does that leave for anyone on the earth? He said, I have all the authority in heaven and all the authority on the earth. Sounds to me like we better be listening to him. We better be paying attention to what Jesus has to say. This is his position. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15 speaks about Jesus once more and describes him in this way, saying that he is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You see this here? Revelation 17, 14 also talks about him being the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so whenever we see Jesus, well, Isaiah saw Jesus, in this light, he's seen Jesus as Lord. He's seen him as as the king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. Where was he? Go back to Isaiah 6, 1. Where was he? Sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Thrones, obviously, are indicative of a king. But high and lifted up means high and lifted up above all. Literally up in the air. And so he's high and lifted up. That's his place of prominence. That's his place where he rules. He is above. Then you keep on reading. The trains of his skirts, he says, the trains filled the temple. That means the skirts of his robe. The train, you're, you're familiar with, with the train on an outfit, aren't you? You think about it. You ladies might have ever wore anything that had a train on it. That sound familiar? How, how, how many years has that been? You remember what that was? And you wear your, they had the, the wedding dress, and oftentimes on the wedding dress there's that extra material on the back that's out here. It takes two or three other girls to carry it around, follow her around, and they'll get it and spread it out. Oh, let's take a pretty picture. And that's about all the time you use it right then, and the rest of the time it's dragging in the way. But you understand that idea of a train, that's a train. Well, God, or in this picture here of Christ, he has that on his robes too. It's the skirts of the robe. He, these are things that a monarch would wear, okay? It's not what a poor person wears. It's not what just anybody would wear. He says that this is what the king would wear, and it says that the train filled the temple, filled it up. In other words, again, that idea of his position, the picture of a magnificent king. Ruling over all. Listen to me. No man is king of kings. No man is lord of lords. But Isaiah got a glimpse of how wonderful Jesus really is. This he said when he saw him and spoke of him. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ, Isaiah did, and wrote about him. Folks, that's the Lord we need to submit to. We need to submit and listen to him. You know what? All power is given unto him, not to anyone else. And as Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Whatever it is you do, whatever it is you say, 
Whatever we're talking about, we're we'll doing it according to his authority and not mine. His authority and no one else's. That's what's got to happen. And folks, that's not happening today and that's not happening in this world and it's not happening in the Lord's church in a lot of places. It's time we've got to get back and do what the Lord says and be satisfied with what he has said with what the king has told us. That's the fact. When Isaiah looked, he saw the king and that's, that's the fact of the matter. Number two, he saw one with power. If you go on in verse number three here, Isaiah six and verse three, he says uh, the, the angels were crying to one another, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. Do you realize, friends, there's nothing we can talk about, visible or invisible, that has not been brought into existence by God? Think about that. What is you can talk about, visible or invisible, whether you're talking about galaxies and stars and the, uh, I saw something just the other day about how large the, the sun is. Uh, here, here's something for your uh, uh, trivia is the earth, how many, one, a million, 1.6 million earths can fit inside the sun right now. You could put a million, over a million earths in the sun. That's how large the sun is. All the way down to the microbe, all the way down to the minute neutron, electron, and the, the quark, all the down to the minutest thing you can imagine, from either extreme you want to talk about, it is Jesus Christ that has made and been a part of that. Nothing on earth, you look in John chapter 1, there's nothing that was made without him. Everything was made by him. He was the one with power. The earth is full of his glory. It is Jesus, my friends, that has the power to create and has done so. He's also the one who has the power to destroy. One day this world will be finished. One day will be done. And whenever this happens, the Bible describes it in Hebrews chapter 1 as like somebody folding up a garment and just putting it away. One day God's going to put everything away. One day Christ is going to do that. He's going to be a part of that. And one day when all this is put away, one day whenever this is destroyed by fire, one day when all of this is gone, the only one who has that kind of power to destroy, that's Jesus himself. You know what? Man can't do that. It's, man cannot physically destroy this earth. Did you know that? If you took all the bombs, all the nuclear bombs and everything that was on this earth right now and, and pushed the button and detonated them all, this earth would still be here. Do you know that? That's a fact. You can't destroy this. A man can't do it. Now, I'm not saying, even though I've said this part, I'm not saying that a man can't do things just to make us miserable while we're here. But you can't destroy this earth. There's just one that can. And one day this earth is going to be destroyed. One day this will be passed away and taken away. And the question is, are you ready? The question is, are you ready to meet the Lord should that happen if it comes to even today? You talk about the whole earth is full of his glory and the power that Christ has. He has the power to answer prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us, don't stop praying. Keep on praying. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. And Philippians 4 and verse 6 says that everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. I'm going to tell you what, folks. We need to be a people of prayer. We need to spend true time and true devotion in prayer to God himself, to prayer and, and to speak and to know that your Savior is listening. Jesus Christ is the mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5 says. He is the mediator between God and men, and we need to pray and understand Jesus says, I am the mediator, I'm hearing every word. I am there. There's power, my friends. There's power to bless us. You know, over in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, he says this too. The book of Ephesians chapter 1 and the verses number 3. He'll talk about the fact that uh, in Jesus, blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. That means in connection with him. That means in a relationship with Christ. 
If you want spiritual blessings and you want to enjoy those, you need to be in Christ to have it. Now, does that mean he doesn't bless anyone else? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45 tells us God sends his, God causes the sun to shine on who? You remember? The just, and that's all. And the unjust. He causes the rain, causes that rain right out there, causes that rain to fall on who? On the just and the unjust. Yes, God loves his creation. He loves us all. Jesus, again, without him, there's no creation anyways. And so he loves us. He's blessed us. We have spiritual blessings in Christ. We have physical blessings. I know I've heard this statement. I know I'm sure it's said over here in West Virginia also. They say something about been a dry spell, long dry spell, whatever. And they say, well, I guess you must not be living right. You know, if you're living right, well, we might have some rain, right? And that's the way that works. Yeah. People say that a lot, don't they? My Bible says, you know what? Even if you're not living right, guess what? God will still have rain for you sun will shine because you need to understand and I need to understand there's a God that loves you unconditionally. There's a God that cares for you and there's a God that hadn't forgot about you. And if he's able to bless you physically and he can, you know he can bless you spiritually when you come to him. He is the one with power and if we come to God though with our hands full, he can't help us. But if we come to God with our hands empty, he'll fill them. That's what he can do. Now, Isaiah sees the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends. He saw the one with absolute holiness. That's point number three. Now, I want you to look back in Isaiah 6 with me and notice again that passage. They cried, the angels cried to one another and notice what they said. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. <coughs> the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy. We need to understand something. It's, I think it's fascinating. Did you know this is the only attribute of God that has ever tripled? Holy, holy, holy. You do not, you do not read in the Bible about saying, uh, you know, power, 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 or, or grace, 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 or even love, love, love. There's no other attribute so described as this one where he says, holy, holy, holy. It's tripled there in that passage. And then later on in Revelation 4 verse 8, and you go all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation 4 verse 8, when John sees a vision of the throne, this, this same thing here from Isaiah 6, he sees a vision of the throne, the lamb sitting on the throne, guess what the angels are doing? The angels are flying around that throne. Guess what they're saying? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 without stopping, without ceasing, day and night crying holy, holy, holy to the Lord. That's what they're doing, around and around and around as they fly around. That very same picture of Isaiah 6 is seen again in Revelation 4. And at both times, again, showing this holiness, this Lord, this Jehovah. Now, it's interesting, I told you a moment ago, he sees the Lord, I'm sorry, Isaiah 6, 1, sees the Lord, that's the word for sovereign. If you look down here, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, that's actually another word. Now it's translated as Lord, but it's actually another word, and it's the word that means eternal. Eternal. Sometimes we use the word Jehovah. And here it says Lord, and it means eternal. Holy, holy, holy is the eternal one. And that's what we see. The holiness of Christ is without question. He was without sin in this world. You remember Hebrews 4 verse 15 speaks about our Lord Jesus. And he says that here he was and he said he did no sin. He was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. 1 Peter 2, verse 21, talks about how, the, uh, again, same idea. He did no sin. Verse 22. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. The word guile means deceit. It means being deceitful or lying to you. 
He did no sin, in other words, no sinful action, neither did he lie with his mouth, that is, he, or sin with his mouth, that is to lie, to be deceitful to somebody or anyone. He didn't lie to you. He didn't deceive you. He showed you and lived the right and godly way. He was a high priest. Hebrews 7, 26, high priest. He said, now, wasn't like these other priests where they offered first for themselves, offered a sacrifice first for themselves and then for the people because they had sinned and then they offered for the people too for their sins. He said, when it comes to Jesus, he did no sin. He wasn't offering for himself. He was offering just for everybody else. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You look on here, folks. He's the one with absolute holiness. In him, 1 John 1 and verse 5 talks about this as well. In him is light, and in him is he was light, and in him is no darkness at all. No darkness. Not even a, a speck of darkness, if you will. Not even a, a shadow of anything. Light and no darkness. Now, what impresses me about this, folks, is the fact that this same description of Isaiah 6. You can go ahead and transfer that over in John 12 and that's what you saw with Jesus. You saw him for 33 years. And that's exact, the exact same one. Holy, holy, holy. Without sin, without any blemish, without anything like that. One with power, one with um, godliness, wisdom. The one who's created all. The one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And isn't that something? Whenever Jesus was on this earth and he uh, was Messiah and all of that, but what did those people do? They went to uh, accuse him. In John chapter 18, they went to accuse him, put him before Pilate, and what did they say? What did the Jews say about him to Pilate? said, this man makes himself a king. And said, we have no king but Caesar. This man makes him a king. Whenever Pilate asked him about that, and he says, are you a king? You remember Jesus' answer? He didn't say no. He said, my kingdom is not from here. Remember that? If I was a king, an earthly king, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. In other words, if I was an earthly king, we wouldn't be talking right now. Understand? Understand? If I, we were an earthly king, we wouldn't be talking. My servants would be fighting. There'd be war outside, outside the walls or wherever. There'd be outside this palace because there'd be fighting going on that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from hence. See, hence means here. Not from hence means not from here. My kingdom is not from here. It's not an earthly kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's one that covers the entire earth. And not just one area or one piece of property or one certain amount of acreage. When Jesus walks this earth, I, what Isaiah saw is what John and what everybody else got to see that day too. For those years, especially those last three years. King, holy, powerful, and all those wonderful attributes. Don't ever forget that. You know, what? I think, I think sometimes as we read our Bibles, I think sometimes we get a disconnect between the descriptions of Messiah in the Old Testament and then what we're reading in the New Testament about this one uh, Jesus who's on earth walking around doing stuff and, and teaching and all that, and you kind of get a disconnect. Folks, don't disconnect it, connect it. Because all those great, wonderful descriptions you find there are in, encapsulated and are incarnated into the human form of Jesus. Don't ever forget it. It's an amazing thing when you truly think about it. I'll move on. What did Isaiah see when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll tell you what else he saw, and that's this. He saw himself. If you go back in your Bible, he's been witness to a wonderful vision an amazing vision in Isaiah 6. And the very next thing, verse 5, he looks at himself. You know how I know that? I know that because in Isaiah 6, 5, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. 
He says, I am a man of unclean lips, dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. Now that word woe doesn't mean like woe like it means in Kentucky. It doesn't mean W-H-O-A. It doesn't mean stop. Woe here is W-O-E. It means sadness. It means calamity. It means something horrible on me. I am undone. The word undone there means that I am destroyed. I am cut off. Uh, some versions say I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He said, well, that's kind of an odd thing to say. Unclean lips, what does that mean? Think about this, folks. Listen, if his lips were unclean, what else was unclean? Matthew 12 and verse 34 says that what defiles you is not what goes into your mouth, but what comes out of it. What comes out are the evil thoughts and the murders and the adulteries and the blasphemies and those things and they're in the heart and they come out through the mouth and that defiles you. Whenever he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, what he's saying is, if my lips are unclean, so is my heart. And by the way, right up here is your Bible heart. You know that? It's not down here. It's not a blood pump. It's up here. That which sees and that which understands and thinks and feels and, and uh, can understand things and, and understands what guilt is and understands what righteousness is and can see and compare things. And he looks at pure holiness and pure uh, love and pure light and all of this. And then he sees himself. I need to get out of here. I am not worthy to stand before you. And what he saw, he saw himself and he says, you know what? I'm dwelling with people just like me. He is brought to the realization that the purest, cleanest person on earth is still filthy in the sight of God. That's a fact. It's kind of like what happened with Peter. I was talking about Peter a while ago. You remember whenever he said, uh, at thy word I will, and they, they, they let down the net and everything. You keep reading Luke chapter 5, and then Jesus, they, as Jesus approaches, and they're getting closer. Peter says, tells him to leave him, depart from me, and Peter says this to Jesus, says, depart from me, I am a sinful man. You know what he was saying? He's saying about like Isaiah right here. What Peter saw when Peter saw Jesus on the boat, Peter saw himself and he didn't like what he saw. Isaiah sees himself and he doesn't like what he sees. Now in Isaiah's case, he says, I'm unclean and I'm awful and I'm wicked and so forth and we're gonna deal with that in a moment. Peter's case, he says, his answer is, Jesus, get away from me. And think about that. See, really, that's the way it is in life. You've got two choices. Whenever you finally come to the realization that it's your sin that put Jesus on the cross, when you finally come to that realization and understand that, that here in, in the eye of faith, you see Jesus dying on this cross and he is clean and spotless and innocent and has done nothing wrong and yet he dies because of what I did. You'll, have to, you'll take, make either one or two choices. You'll either humbly bow before him and beg his forgiveness or you'll tell Jesus, get away from me. See, I don't like what I'm seeing. But how much sense does that make? If you stand before a mirror, I don't know how many people stood before a mirror this morning, but I did. I did two or three times. Did it work? <laughs> you stand before a mirror and you look at yourself and, and you make sure that you look nice and clean and you're just so and all this. You stand before that mirror and Look, you don't like what you see. Maybe your hair's all messed up or maybe you got you know, food uh, there around your 
the mouth and everything you didn't get wiped up and maybe your shirt's untucked or whatever. Maybe you're just, just not what you need to be. Now you have two options as you look before that mirror. You have two options. You can fix all the things I just talked about or you can get rid of the mirror. Which one are you going to do? You see, here's the thing. If you get rid of the mirror, you're still as dirty as you ever were. It's just that you don't have to see it now. But you're going to voice that on all of us to have to look at. Understand? You get rid of the mirror, you didn't, you didn't change anything. Now, if you look in the mirror and you make changes, then that makes you look better and that kind of helps us out too. So we don't have to look at it. Right? So there's those two options. That's what you're seeing here between Isaiah and Luke 5. Only they're talking about real things that really matter. I am undone. Now you can bow down before God and Jesus and you can bow down before your Lord and you can beg for forgiveness and he'll forgive you and you can be right and you can be cleansed and clean. That's what's coming up with that coal business. You can do that. Or you can go and say, get away from me, Jesus. I don't want to see you anymore. I want to be around you. And there's people like that today. You can talk to them about the weather. You can talk to them about gardening. You can talk to them about the race to Mars. You can talk to them about whatever you want to do. But don't you talk about Jesus. If you do, I'm through talking to you. Bye, see you, goodbye. Don't talk to me if you're going to talk about Jesus. There's a dear lady I know right now. A widow. She's been a child of God for 50 years. I don't know what's happened through the years and I, I don't want to know. I can't imagine what's happened through the years. But whatever's happened to her, her children have told her to her face. Don't you talk to me about Jesus. I don't think they could have hurt their mother. You couldn't have spit in her face and upset her or hurt her any worse than when you tell that child of God, don't talk to me about Jesus. But here's my point. Kind of like getting rid of the mirror. You push Jesus out of the picture and you push him away. I want to talk to him. I want to think about him. I don't want anything about that. Don't talk to me. Did that change how sinful you are? Did that change your soul status in any way? Think about that. See, shake or nod. Did that change anything at all? See, so you go like this. That didn't change a thing. That didn't change anything in her soul when you got rid of Jesus. Just like it didn't change anything when you got rid of the mirror. The only time it changes is whenever we accept what we see and when we turn to the Lord and ask for God's forgiveness, and that's what we see Isaiah doing. When we see ourselves as we really are, we'll leave that even which is the hardest for us to leave to be right with God. And so that's what we see here in this last section. You know what Isaiah saw when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ? He saw somebody that could forgive sins. And there when he came with that, the angel came with that coal and put it there on his mouth. And he said, thy sins are purged. You know what the word purge means? Purge means cancel. Purge means make atonement or cleanse. Forgive, pardon. It means reconcile. That's what the word means. And so whenever he saw this situation, God here in Christ through this vision and through that vision to, to put that coal on, on his lips says you are forgiven, you are reconciled, you are pardoned. And folks, whenever we look at Jesus today, we need to see, sometimes people say, well, you know, that Jesus business, you know, Jesus was, I mean, he was, he was real, you know, he was, he was a good guy. And he's a good teacher and things like that. But he wasn't really the son of God. You heard people say that? I have. 
And there's two things wrong with that. Number one, it's just not so. Number two, if he's a good teacher and a good guy and, a, and you know, has some good ideas and all that, he can't be too good of a teacher because he's fooled people and lied people and lied to people and let them think he's the son of God. I don't know about you, but I don't think it's a very good teacher that lies to people. I don't think it's a very good teacher that, that misleads people and deceives them. But see, Jesus was the son of God and is the son of God and forgives men of their sins. Jesus in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 if you look over there at that Zacchaeus time period, Jesus, Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. He said, that's why I'm here. John, John the Baptist, would look at Jesus in John 1, 29. John the Baptist would declare, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You just go on and you see this over and over again until the day in Acts chapter 2 whenever the people cried out, having been found guilty of killing and crucifying the Son of God and murdering the matchless Messiah. And when they did this, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Remember what Peter said? Peter told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Whenever he, tell, whenever he told them that, whenever he revealed that to him, Folks, there's the source of your forgiveness. You repent and you be baptized. See that? You turn back to the Lord. You turned away from him and you killed him. And just as he promised to do then, Jesus will forgive sins yet today. He'll forgive the worst of sinners and give them salvation. How do I know? Because uh, the apostle Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. And he was forgiven. And he said, I'm forgiven to show people that God will have grace, have mercy on you too. He forgave me, I know he'll forgive you. And whenever Isaiah sees the Lord Jesus all those years ago, he saw the one with forgiveness. Folks, you're not going to get forgiveness from anyone else. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is. I don't care how long you've lived. I don't care how much money you have or how many houses you own. When it comes to your forgiveness, man doesn't forgive you, and he can't forgive you. When it comes to that type of thing, man has no ability that way and has no power that way. There's only one that forgives, and that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He'll forgive you, and he'll make you right. I don't know what you've done. And quite frankly, I don't need to know. The fact is, God knows, and that's the point. Whenever you sin, you can turn back to God in that forgiveness, and that's what, what we find here. Turn to the one who's holy. Turn to the one who loves you. Turn to the one who cares for you. Turn to the one who's died on the cross and look for that salvation. When you think seriously and soberly about these things, should there be one or more here even this morning that needs to become a Christian? Why don't you do so? Why don't you become a child of God? Just as we've talked about Jesus as the one who will forgive. His blood was shed for the remission of sins. And now, if you'll but believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, 24. If you will repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. Confess your faith in Christ that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, verse 37. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <coughs> we'll take him, baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38, that you might rise to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4, that you might enjoy the blessings that are in Christ, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, and follow him all the days of your life. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. To wear the name of Christ, Acts eleven twenty six, And to show others the way as well, as 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2 teaches us. Show and bring others with you to Christ. So that not only are you saved, but we can bring more with us. You have an opportunity here even this week. 
and take opportunity. I know you've invited folks and talked to folks about the gospel meeting. This is the time to go back and catch them again. This is the time to turn the heat up, folks. And not time to say, well, the week's going on, so I guess it's too late. No, this is the time you turn the heat up. This is the time you go back and say, you remember that meeting I was talking to you about the other day? It's here. It's here. Time to be here. And to encourage folks to come. You need to be here. Need to be here tonight. Need to be here every night. As we study and talk about Jesus and who he is and what he's done and what that means for us every single day. If you've been faithful to the Lord and served him, then good. Continue to do what the Lord says. But if you've fallen away and you need to come back to God, you can repent of those things, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And you can be right in the sight of God once more. So whether it is that you need to be baptized or whether it is that you need to return as a fallen away Christian and you need to return and come back to the fold, we have time for you to sit right now even where you can come and to be right with God. If you're subject in whatever way, why don't you make your way forward right now while we're standing.